the centrality of the teaching of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in the scriptures is clearly evident when we read chapters such as we just have begun to read there in 1 Corinthians 15. And what I want to do tonight is just look at seven Bible passages that demonstrate, we think, quite plainly, not only the importance of that teaching, but equally importantly, what it means for us and why it matters that Jesus died and rose again and how that influences us and should influence us in our daily lives. So I'd like to go to the first of those passages, which is actually to be found in Luke chapter 24. Because the New Testament tells us quite plainly what the risen Lord Jesus was like. If we're familiar at all with the Gospels, we appreciate that that short period of time, those few years when Jesus was preaching through the cities and towns of Nazareth and then into Jerusalem and in all the other places of the land of Israel that he preached, that that short time was ended by his crucifixion. And yet the New Testament reveals that although he died, that was not the end. That he was raised out of his, out of his death and given new life. And Luke 24 is telling us about that time when he appeared again with his disciples, those who were learning of him. Now Luke 24, if we just go in at verse 36, he's with one group of people and... It says in verse 36, as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. So here's a group of his followers. And we must remember when we're reading this, that firstly, they never expected him to die. We can read of how he warned them that it would happen, but few of them, it seems, had really grasped that principle. But no sooner had they had to confront that reality, then now they were faced with the reality of his appearance again amongst them. And this chapter is recording for us that, that very fact. So Jesus himself stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And they initially thought, well, is this some kind of ghostly appearance? They couldn't account for him being amongst them once again. Other Gospels tell us the doors were locked and there he was in the middle of them. It was humanly impossible that they could be seeing what they were seeing. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Well, it was, in one sense, it was plainly apparent why. But the Lord was getting at something else as he always was with those he spoke to. He was always trying to develop their understanding, to take their minds beyond where they were and to go beyond their limitations. And so he carries on there in verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. So you see there that there Jesus was saying to them very plainly, it is I myself. Behold my hands and my feet. And we might just reflect what it was that they would see when they looked at Jesus' hands and his feet. As we well know, they would see the marks of those nails that had been put into him, the marks of crucifixion. And only a few verses before in Luke 24, you can read of, of how those who were on the road to Emmaus, well, that they knew it was him, in the breaking of bread, when, of course, as he broke the bread, they would see the marks of those nails. So the whole point of what the Lord Jesus was doing here was to reinforce for them the reality that it was really him. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. The risen Lord was the same Lord that they had known. This was the same Lord Jesus whom they had followed through those years of his ministry. And in fact, as, as we can read on there, verse 40, when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, have you any meat? You got anything to eat, he says. And now they gave him a piece of a broad fish of an honeycomb and he took it and did eat it before them. 
You see how he's anxious to set at mind, uh, to set at peace their concerns. In verse 37 and 39, they'd spoken of a spirit. Well, there he says, no, it is I myself. In fact, in verse 39, it says, a, a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. So the bodily reality of the resurrected Lord Jesus is really what he was trying to demonstrate to them. And, and wonderfully, really, how he cared for them and sought to really demonstrate to them the reality of the Lord that was in front of them. Now, as we shall see, that phrase, flesh and bones, is really very significant because it speaks to us of the fact that he was still recognisably a body of flesh and bones, although there was a distinction with how he had been before. There's another point, I think, that comes out to us from that little passage, and that is this. Now, when we read of all those remarkable events that took place, you know, it's very true to life. I'm not going to pursue this point too far, but I said before that the disciples hadn't expected him to die. Still less did they expect him to rise. And the Gospel writers, under inspiration from God himself, are giving us what is a very psychologically accurate picture. They are not expecting him to arise, and so they're very surprised. This isn't some fictionalised account. Of course, there's a classic book. It's not a Christadelphian publication, but it's very well reasoned in as far as it's trying to really open out what the Scriptures reveal of the, the accounts of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And it, this is one of the, the things that it pursues, the fact that the reality of the behaviour of the disciples, along with all the other theories that people have put out about how it was that, that, that uh, one could account for the apparent resurrection of Jesus, drove this man, who of course hadn't started out believing the records, but he was compelled by force of the argument of Scripture itself to conclude the only explanation was that Jesus really had risen from the dead, as the Scriptures had said. So I'm not going to pursue that argument any, any further, but just to note that really the, the records themselves have within them the evidence of that which really we would expect from our own experience. Let's go on to our second passage then, which is 1 Corinthians 15, that reading that we took together. And having just considered what really the Scriptures lay out for us as the reality of the experience of the risen Jesus, they saw him a body of flesh and bone, somebody recognisable. It is I myself, somebody who could eat before them, not a spirit, not a ghost in any sense. 1 Corinthians 15. Well, now the Apostle has shown us in the first eight verses of all the witnesses who saw the, who saw the risen Lord. I mean, just scan down what, what we read there in 1 Corinthians 15. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Here's the good news, the gospel, he says, which you have received and wherein you stand. This, of course, is a, is a frequent refrain of the apostle. I have preached this to you and you've got to hold on to it. You've received it and you've got to stand in it and not lose the wonderful truth that he'd given you. By which also you're saved, you're being saved, verse 2. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, you can't miss the emphasis with which, with which the Apostle is stating this. And there's a good reason for that, as we shall see. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And the Apostle is going to lay out for them, look, this message I've had, as he says elsewhere in Galatians, I, I didn't receive it just from men. It's not, it's not what people have made up. It's from God himself. It's through his Son, of whom I was given a revelation, says Paul. It's the divine teaching I'm passing on, and this is it, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So you can look back, says the Apostle, to what we know as our Old Testament Scriptures, the Hebrew Scriptures, and in them, he says, is the evidence that the Christ would die, and not only so, verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the death of Christ and his burial and his resurrection are all to be spoken of in the Hebrew Scriptures. And, and we shall just see a hint of that as we move on this evening. Now here's the point, verse 5, that he was seen of Cephas, Peter, and then of the twelve. 
Well, we just read one account of that, didn't we, in Luke 24, when the disciples who were together saw the risen Lord. But he goes on, and last, uh, sorry, verse um, 6, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. So you notice that when the apostle wrote this, if it wasn't true, he was putting forward something quite extraordinary, wasn't he? He was inviting his readers to go and check it out for themselves. He's saying, look, you don't only have to speak to 12 men. There are 500 witnesses who saw the risen Lord between that period of his resurrection and his ascension to heaven. And Paul says, well, some of them have fallen asleep. Some of them have died, but many of them are still awake now. And you can go and speak to them. And they could tell you about their experiences of what it was like to meet the Lord. Can you imagine that? After his resurrection? And those things that he said. A man who'd been dead and come back to life. And you could go and speak to him. They wouldn't forget that in a hurry, would they? And last of all, verse 8. He was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Paul, you recall on the road to Damascus, was given a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. A vision that convinced him of the reality of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Even though he believed it was so wrong, this teaching, that he was going around persecuting the, the, the believers and putting them in prison and putting them to death. And it switched him right round. So, there's the first point. The reality of the necessity is there by witness. And Paul is appealing to them. Go and check it out for yourself. Now, come down to verse 13. Verse 12, in fact. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? If that's what we're preaching, that the resurrection of Christ happened, why is it that there are some among you saying, well, he never did rise? Now, you recall I said a moment ago that at the beginning of the chapter, the apostle is so urgent to say, this is the message I've received, and I'm passing it on to you, and you've got to keep it safe. And already, this fundamental aspect of the truth was being lost by some people saying, well, he didn't rise from the dead. And now he's going to go through and explain the consequences of losing that belief. Verse 13. If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If the concept of the resurrection isn't true, well, Christ can't have been raised. That's the first point. If there's no resurrection, well, Christ didn't rise from the dead. And if that was true, verse 14, if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is vain. So there's the next point he goes on. If it's true that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, well, our preaching and your faith is pointless, vain, empty. That's the meaning of the word. So all this that I'm doing, says Paul, when I left behind my very nice career in, in the, you know, the topmost rungs of the Jewish ladder was all pointless. So it meant something for the apostle to believe this, didn't it? This wasn't just something that was just an interesting academic exercise. This was a man who gave up everything because he's absolutely convinced of the truth of that vision that he had seen. And in fact, the Lord appeared to him on more than that occasion as we read through the New Testament. And not only so, your faith, your belief, it all goes for nothing. That's how central this teaching is in the New Testament as we read it. Verse 15, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. We, we've, we've made God a liar because we've said God has raised him. And if God didn't raise him, you see, so he's, he's, there's even another point here of some significance and seriousness. We have falsely witnessed to Christ's resurrection. And anyone who speaks for God, must speak the truth of his word. That's another very clear New Testament, well, scriptural principle, isn't it? Verse 17, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, 
you are yet in your sins. Your sins remain unforgiven. There's something about the resurrection of Christ then that has to do with the forgiveness of sins. And without that, there's no hope for any of us, says the Scriptures. It's absolutely fundamental. And verse 18, here's the point. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Now, there's two words in that verse that are really important. The first is those who have fallen asleep, you notice. And it's the same word, the same idea that we had at the end of verse 6. Remember? Of those 500, many of whom, he says, are alive and remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So the apostle is using this idea of sleep to talk of those who have died, and yet he uses another word, doesn't he, in verse 18? He uses the word perished. So that there is a distinction between falling asleep and perishing. And the point, of course, is that falling asleep implies a waking, whereas perishing, which really the word is the sense of lost, entirely gone forever, never to wake, or at least not to have hope of life again. So you can see then really the point that he's making. There is a difference, and those in Christ have a hope, he says, which is akin to, well, going to sleep and waking up again. And isn't it marvellous that the Almighty has given us such an example so that we understand what it's like. And every night we have that ability, and sometimes more than just at night, to, to just drop off gently and to receive some strength. Do you know, I was reading only, I think it was only this morning in actual fact, on the BBC website, and they had an article about how mysterious sleep is. Not only how essential it is, and how we all need to have enough sleep, to, to keep alive and healthy, but, but how even from an evolutionary standpoint, it's, it's a real conundrum. You know, because, well, if you go to sleep, well, then, then obviously you're, you can't defend yourself. And the first animal that suddenly found that remarkable ability to fall asleep would have been, of course, come along and taken over by its next predator. And the article was saying this is one of the great mysteries that they're wrestling with. Well, there it is. A hope, says the Scriptures, of being awoken. And see where he goes in verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Or really the sense is we are most to be pitied. That's really the sense of the word. Everything that we do, he says, has no meaning if the resurrection isn't true. It's all bound up, all our faith and our hope, in the fact that even though we die, that need not be the end. And it all starts with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the basis of it all. So, here is the scriptures and here is their wonderful teaching. Let's just go to verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So just think about what the teaching here is telling us. We all start out, says the scriptures, in Adam. As descendants of Adam's race, all the way back from Genesis chapter 3, the scriptures tell us, we start out in death. That's our natural inheritance. And yet, says verse 22, in Christ, we have the opportunity of being alive to God. Verse 22, in, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. It's, no, it's obviously no kind of automatic thing. Our natural automatic inheritance, and even our right, if you like, is six foot under. But here's a hope of something better. To be alive in Christ, to be part of him. Now verse 20 though, just go back a step. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits? of them that slept. And he uses that word again for a third time. We've talked about this idea of slept then. Christ is as the first fruits, And this is the idea, isn't it, of that first, of a much greater harvest. So Christ is the first. He's not the only one. We've seen him, haven't we, in Luke 24, raised. But he's not the only one. He's just the first of a great and mightier harvest, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. And when is the rest of the harvest to happen then? 
When is the resurrection of others who are to be like him then in some way to be raised from the dead? Verse 23. Every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. So here's this other great New Testament teaching. That that Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose and ascended to heaven is going to come back. And when he comes back, well those who are his, those who are in Christ, are going to be raised like him. And at the other end of that period of time that the Father has put in his purpose, there is to be a great harvest of those who are in him. So you can see that we started off with the Lord Jesus Christ, raised in front of them. Remember, not a spirit, a body, a flesh and bones blood body, but could eat and walk and talk and was recognisably himself. And however he was, says the scriptures, he was the first fruits of a great harvest who are going to be brought into reality at the, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the rest, the rest of the scriptures tell us that all those faithful people who have lived in past ages, it won't matter whether they've been Noah, or Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, or the prophets, or David, or whoever they are, whenever they have lived, they're all to be brought together to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And even us. Whether we wake, says the Apostle elsewhere, or whether we sleep when the Lord comes. You see, there is a generation who will be alive when the Lord Jesus comes. And there's every indication that he's out the door. And so that whether we are alive when he comes or whether we have fallen asleep won't make any difference in God's purpose. Together, we will be brought to him. But we need to go a step back. Our third passage, in fact, takes us back to the book of Romans, chapter 7, because there's an important principle that we need to understand. We, we've thought about the Lord Jesus being raised, and we've thought about the importance of that teaching and our opportunity, but we need to just understand something first. And I suppose the first question, then, is to ask, well... It's all very well to speak of Jesus rising. Well, why did he die in the first place? And I think there's some clues in this passage too. Romans 7 verse 18. And it's going in the middle of an argument here where the apostle is describing his daily struggle. And it's encouraging, I think, when we read these words. Here's a godly man who is very open about his difficulties to obey God's law. He wants to do the right thing. Well, just look at him. Verse 18. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So he says, I, I know what the right thing to do is, and I want to do it, but I find it the most difficult thing to do. Have you ever had that experience? Can you imagine putting a jar of sweets on a table and telling a toddler not to touch it? That there is something in, our, in us that finds the very thing that we're forbidden to do, the most difficult thing. Not only toddlers, either. So the apostle is very open about his struggle that, that I'm sure we can understand. So he goes on in verse 19, The good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. I know what the right thing to do is, and I want to do it, but I find so often it is the most difficult thing to do, he says. In me, in my flesh, there's nothing good, he says. So he goes on in verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? 
I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see, what he's dealing with in this passage is the reality of our experience. He finds a law. But when he says in verse 20, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth it. He's not excusing himself. He's not saying he's not responsible. He's recognising it as a law of nature, that he finds his pull is naturally towards sin. And he finds it much easier to do the wrong thing than the right thing. He calls it a law of sin in his bodily members. That's his daily experience. And you see, when we think about it, that's the connection, isn't it, with what he calls in verse 24, a body of death. That's what he has. That's what he's wrestling with. And the Lord Jesus Christ experienced that same struggle and gloriously overcame it. The difference with the Lord was he who was holy, harmless, undefiled in character was the same as us in body. He was obedient to the point of death, says the Apostle in Philippians. And he overcame it. And every time that temptation came to him in every form, he saw it for what it was. He saw it a mile off. Where we so often just bumble through it half the time and don't even realise, perhaps. But he saw it. And he overcame it. So, think now of the fact that the Old Testament scriptures had given us a picture of resurrection. Psalm 16 shows us the Lord Jesus Christ from an Old Testament perspective. His resurrection is there. Now you'll see from verse 1 that this is actually a psalm of David. And we'll see that confirmed for us in the New Testament in a moment. He says in uh, Verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is my, my right hand I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth, my flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And what he's talking about is the reality of the fact that although he might die, there is something better in store. The concept of corruption is that process that we're all familiar with, of, well, once we cease to exist, of turning back to the dust from which we were created. And he says, well, there is a hope. In fact, he goes on, doesn't he, in verse 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures for evermore. So he has a concept of a life beyond this one. When he's going to rest in hope, he says, because at thy right hand, at God's right hand. So his, his relationship with the Father, with his God, is not ended necessarily by death. At some way and in some point, in some time, he can see some way in which that relationship can be preserved. Neither, verse 10, wilt thou leave my soul in hell or in the grave. His life isn't going to be left there. But rather, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now what's interesting is, when we just read that psalm, we would expect that it's referring to David. And true it is that David was a godly man who had a hope of resurrection. But we shall find, if we just go on to Acts chapter 2, that actually... It was not applying directly to David himself. Just see how the Apostle Peter explains it for us. And by the way, I think we can be reasonably confident that not only, well, we are absolutely confident that Peter is speaking under inspiration of God, but I think there's a very good evidence to suggest that what Peter is actually doing is giving the teaching that the Lord Jesus gave him after the resurrection, when Luke 24 says elsewhere in that chapter, that the Lord Jesus opened the scriptures unto them and showed them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself and how it was necessary for him to die. 
So verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did among you, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. So verse 22, first of all, here's a man approved by God. That's what he was. A man God approved of. He had to be a man because he had to be the first fruits. He had to be the one that God was going to bring out of the dust. Who had to experience life as we did, tempted, says the scriptures, in all points like as we are. One who fought against this flesh that the apostle described in Romans chapter 7. A body that was condemned to death. And yet to remain sinless. So here he is. And look what's happened to him in verse 23. Being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God's purpose. This is what God wanted to happen according to the scriptures. Well God has, verse 24, raised him up. Having loosed the pains of death. Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. God's purpose was such that although he died... That could not be the end. It was not possible <coughs> that he should be held and checked, chained, if you like, by death. As a descendant of Adam, as the seed of the woman, death may have been his natural end, but he was not a sinner. The wages of sin is death, we read. Well, he had not earned that. And so he was raised. Verse 29 tells us, Let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. And now he's going to explain that that psalm that he's just referred to is not in fact about David, for he says, he being a prophet, verse 30, knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spoke of the resurrection of Christ. That his soul was not left in hell. He didn't stay in the grave. Neither did his flesh see corruption. He didn't turn back to the dust. He wasn't there long enough, was he? So the whole point is, firstly, that there's the principle of resurrection spoken of in the Old Testament. We've seen that in Psalm 16. And also that it speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. One who was to be raised to sit at God's right hand. That's who David was talking about in Psalm 16. And this Jesus has God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. So how important it was then that the Lord Jesus Christ was the first then to break the bonds of death. One who was like us and yet so unlike us and because of that the father raised him to a new life and we can understand the significance of that if we go to Romans chapter 6 what the apostle is doing very very powerfully in Romans chapter 6 is comparing the experience of the death and the resurrection of Christ with our experience if we're trying to follow him and of course he's going to talk about the principle of baptism in order to do that. That's really the, the whole thrust of the chapter, isn't it? He says in Romans 6 verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. Remember we said in Adam we are dead. It's only a matter of time before the Lord, before our death comes. But if we are in Christ, death is but asleep. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, he will awake us. Of course, there is a little more to say on that, isn't there? The scriptures hold out another principle as well, don't they? That those who have known of these things, whether baptised or not, also are answerable to account before him, to appear before him. The apostle makes that very plain in several places, 2 Corinthians 5. Not, with, not, not the least of them. 
But to have a hope of life in his kingdom can only happen in Christ. And that's what this chapter is all about in baptism. Just look at verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So he's drawing the parallel, isn't he? There is the Lord Jesus, woken up from death. And after baptism, he says, after having gone down into that water, you've paralleled him in death and come back to life. And, and I want to come back to that point in a moment. But just go on in verse 5. He says, if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be in his resurrection. We have to pattern in ourselves then his death and also his resurrection. You see, it's very far from saying, well, Jesus died and rose and now I can do as I'm like. I'm free. The whole point of the apostles' the teaching is that we are to pattern our life on his experience. He has died that we might die and live new. That's the whole point, isn't it? Knowing this, verse 6. That our old man is crucified with him. Now, I don't know what picture that conjures up in your mind. Our old man is crucified with him. You remember when the Lord Jesus died, there were two thieves, says the gospel, on either side of him. One who rejected him and one who in that moment accepted him. One who said, well, you know, terrible man this. And the other man said, this man's done nothing wrong. It's right, we're here. We're, we're receiving the due reward of our deeds. This man has never done anything wrong. And you see, the scriptures are inviting us to see ourselves with that man. Acknowledging our need of his salvation. And to, like that thief, die with the Lord. Our old man, our natural way of thinking and acting, has got to be crucified, he says. And that doesn't sound a pleasant process. And it isn't, in a sense. It's the very thing that the Apostle was talking about, only in chapter 7, only the next chapter, wasn't it? That difficulty between, well, what I want to do and what God wants me to do. So we have to share then in, in our experience the death of Jesus and his resurrection. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That's the, that's the objective you see. You see, we talked before about the, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ as a body of flesh and bones. So it's a really important distinction, isn't there, that Hebrews chapter 2 tells, tells us about. It says that we are flesh and blood. Which is an expression we sometimes use, I think, isn't it? A anyway, in our general language that we say, well, he's our own flesh and blood, he's our own family or whatever. But that's speaking of our, of our natural inheritance. And that had to be destroyed, he says. The body of sin, it had to be destroyed. And the Lord Jesus did it in his life by overcoming it every point of the way and ultimately by submitting to death on the tree. Finally, putting it away. And we have to share that, he says, in our everyday experience when we choose to do God's will rather than ours, failingly as we will. So you see the point, verse 4, in that he died, this is verse 10, sorry, in that he died, he died unto sin once. That resisting that he had led to his death once. But now, he says, in that he lives, he lives to God. He died once to sin, and now he lives to God. And that has to be our experience too. Just then, remember, as we read through those verses, just see the, the detail and the care with which the Apostle parallels the experiences of the Lord Jesus Christ and ours, and how he wants us to think about it. You see, he says in verse 6, we are crucified with him. And I've talked about the thief, either side of him. And verse 8 says, we were dead with him. And verse 4 says, we are buried with him. Can you see that we are to see ourselves as absolutely part of him, at one with his experiences? And then verse 5, raised with him. And the contrast between his natural life 
And now that body of immortality that he has free to do God's will. Absolutely. Well then we're to see our own lives after baptism. As desiring to be like that. Of course we will fail. But the whole principle of the New Testament is that there is forgiveness for those who come to God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who seek his mercy and his forgiveness. And who try to follow him. And plead his forgiveness where we fail. But that's our pattern. That's what we desire to be like. That finally. We might live with him. In his kingdom. To bear that same nature that he now has. You see it doesn't end there. Here's the principle. We start out in Adam. Which is death. And we go through the waters of baptism. And we become into Christ. Which is life. And you see, there is no life outside him. There is no hope outside of him. And the scriptures paint it for us very plainly. On then to our final passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, I just want to go to the very end of that chapter. And there's a lot more detail that we can't talk about. But just remember what he's doing in this chapter. He is not talking 1 Corinthians 15 about the process of the judgment. He's not dealing with those who when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. And if we've known of these things we're brought before him. Whether we've dead or been dead or whether we've been living. When he comes will make no difference. If we know of these things and we die we'll be raised to answer before him. He's not dealing with that. He's, he's going to deal with that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So let us never think whatever this passage says. That we've done away with the judgment. And then the interpretation we take on it must never have that effect either. But what he is doing is he's following what happens to those who have come to the Lord God in the Lord Jesus and faithfully sought his will. Just look at it in verse 50. Those who've died, those who are living, well, they're coming together before the Lord Jesus. This I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Flesh and blood is what we are naturally, he says. And the kingdom of God is of an entirely different order of things. That which naturally limits us and causes it to be so difficult to do God's will has to be removed. For a start, it's mortal. And God's kingdom is about the immortal. It's corruptible and decaying and dying and that's not going to be in God's kingdom, he says. So, here it is. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The body of sin, we read, had to be destroyed. Verse 51. I show you a mystery. I tell you a secret, that's what he's saying. We shall not all sleep. Remember, we've read that already. We've read it three times already in 1 Corinthians 15. Here it is again. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You see, now in these verses, he's not talking about the process of coming out of the grave. He's not. If he was, it would only be those people who come out of the graves who were going to be changed. So just note this, because it's very important when you read through these verses. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. And the last trumpet that shall be blown here is that which is associated with, well, he says, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now, if we talk of the last trumpet, it suggests there must be a first trumpet, doesn't it? And 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us of that. The first trumpet is when the Lord Jesus returns to his people and he calls them to himself. 1 Thessalonians 4 says that he's going to raise the dead and gather the living to him. That's the first trumpet. That's the time when the dead come out of their graves. Well, that isn't this time. This is the last trumpet. This is the time. Well, look what verse 50, what 52 says. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. This isn't dead people coming out of their graves when it says raised. This is being raised to an entirely new nature. This is to be given a body. This raising is not a waking up from sleep. But an elevation in nature. 
it has to apply not only to people who have been dead and been woken up, but to people who are alive when Christ comes back. Verse 52 told us that. This is what it is. There are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. So there is flesh and blood which is our natural inheritance, which is death. And there is the divine nature that the Lord Jesus Christ now has. A body free from temptation and tiredness and sin and anything else that might limit our ability to serve and to glorify our creator. All taken out of the way. There's the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, a body not of flesh and blood, but of flesh and bones. And that's what he's promised to us, even as he was the first fruits, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You see, there is a physical corruption associated with our body that we read about, and there is, if you like, a moral corruption too. That's the inevitable consequence of living in this body with which we wrestle, as the Apostle spoke about in Romans chapter 7. And that's all going to be taken out of the way that we might serve God. And so as he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, so verse 54, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. God is going to do away with it entirely so that his people can serve him. And at the end of the thousand years of God's kingdom, the only beings who will be alive beyond that time, are those who are able to serve him. Can you imagine being in a world full of people like the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you imagine being able to please the Father, to do his will absolutely, and that everyone with whom you associate is similarly able to do that? And all those hindrances and difficulties taken out of the way, that's what God is promising. So let's just pull together the strands of what we've looked at together in those seven passages. We saw as we started off in Luke 24 that Jesus showed himself alive after his resurrection as recognisably himself. He, had, he was a body of flesh and bones, but it is I myself. We saw how Jesus' resurrection is central to the gospel, absolutely essential. Christ is to be the first fruits of a much greater harvest. We saw that there was nothing good in flesh. It is rightly related to death. Jesus overcame it. He was obedient to the point of death. Even death on that tree we read. The Old Testament gives hope of resurrection and a life with God. We only looked at one passage. There are many, of course, just as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, because of Jesus' obedience, he could not stay dead. And God raised him from the dead. But the hope is not just for him. God wanted to bring not just one son to glory, but a multitude. Through baptism, we share in the death and resurrection of Christ and become in him. When Jesus returns... He will raise the faithful to share the divine nature. So that.